Hello, thanks for joining us for another episode of NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice on Cannabis Radio. I am your host, Bethany Moore. I'm the Director of Communications at the National Cannabis Industry Association. Today we're doing part two of an episode with Matthew Grimes and Jody Green, who are on our Risk Management and Insurance Committee. Jody Green is a business attorney in Miller Nash's Los Angeles office, focusing on cannabis and policyholder insurance recovery. And she was named by super lawyers as a rising star in insurance coverage for five consecutive years. The firm Miller Nash has 140 member law firm, has nearly 30 attorneys practicing in its nationally recognized cannabis group alone. The cannabis team serves cannabis companies operating in all industry verticals by providing advice in all legal practice areas from corporate formation to employment to insurance coverage and litigation and everything in between. Matt Grimes is the principal of the Grimes Law Group and sits on the committee, as I mentioned, currently serves as the webinar content chairperson for the committee and is vice chair of the American Bar Association's Cannabis Law and Policy Committee since last year. He's also a manager of the International Cannabis Bar Association and involved in several state cannabis industry associations and advocacy groups. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Great. So as I mentioned, uh, this is part two of an episode. Uh, So a few weeks or months ago, we were talking about cannabis consumption lounges, and we just had so much to say about it that we decided to come back uh, and jump back into our conversation about it. We covered in that episode what they are, the purpose they serve, as well as how the models, the business models of those cannabis consumption lounges compare and contrast to other industries. And then we also began to dip our toes into the liabilities and risks associated with how consumption lounges as businesses can protect themselves from something going wrong or what to do when something does go wrong. Um, so let's pick back up there. Ah, uh, Jody, what else is coming to mind for us about the risks associated with cannabis consumption lounges? Yeah, well, I think the the primary risk that we hear about or that governments are thinking about in implementing re- regulations is preventing overconsumption. Um, and so the question for lounge owners is, what can we do to prevent overconsumption when cannabis is, you know, very markedly different from uh, evaluating uh, intoxication with alcohol? Um, so a few of the things I think we might have hit on these last time, although it's it's been a few weeks or a month, so I don't recall exactly what we covered. Um, so I'll just list them again and Matt, feel free to jump mm-hmm. in. But, you know, big issues here in terms of limiting risk is is implementing responsible beverage service training. Um, so, you know, regardless of whether that's required by the state or the locality where the lounge is operating, right? Um, businesses would be well advised to implement standards and even consider hiring an outside entity to conduct that sort of training, just like a bar or restaurant would. Um, And thinking in terms of the lowest common denominator, right? Like who is the novice, kind of curious person who's coming in here and knows nothing? Um, What does that person need to know about what they're consuming and how it's going to affect them, how long it will uh, last and and what the onset time is. Um, I think that's very important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you're probably going to have like five or six different or maybe more uh, customer personas, exactly from the novice and curious to the uh, the veteran cannabis consumer. Is that right? Yeah, of course. And and you know, of course, um, you know, there might be some pushback from the 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 veteran OGs, right? You know, I don't want a server trying to tell me about all these things when I know what I'm doing. Um, there might be some tension there, uh, but it's very important to at least have the information available, whether it's in a menu or, um, you know, training the server to uh, ask questions of of their guests before 
you know, they just let them order anything willy nilly. So it is important to get that information up front from the consumers so that they know, you know, what level of information to to share and to educate them. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, like at Applebee's, you've got the uh, the bachelorette party coming in, all these <laughs> women with high energy, they're, they're going to roll into the cannabis consumption lounge too. And that's, that's going to be its own fun party, I'm sure. <laughs> There, yeah, I can imagine there will be all sorts, right? Like it, it's going to be a huge tourist attraction. Um, and there, you know, Las Vegas is is just, you know, Las Vegas and Nevada are just about getting ready to to launch lounges there too. So um, a lot of venues are going to be tourist attractions. They're going to need to think in terms of, like I said, the lowest common denominator, giving more education at the outset, and then. Um, yeah, just really understanding what the consumer's uh, level of understanding and education is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Matthew, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, you know, I couldn't agree more. You, it is, you know, immensely important to have uh, an education forward approach with the consumer. But it doesn't just end with the consumer that, of course, and, and Jody touched on this, but that needs to translate to how you're training your staff. Uh, and additionally, any security guards or security officers that you have on premise. And so what happens in the event that someone is overserved? Do you have a process there? Are you able to identify that patron? Are you able to talk with that patron in a way that doesn't you know, offend them immediately? Are you able to settle up with that patron? In other words, are they able to pay the bill? Uh, before, you know, you help them find a ride home through, you know, ride sharing services or whatever the protocol calls for. Yeah. And on the point of ride sharing, you know, something that I've seen some lounges do and that can be implemented is just advance agreement to that ride sharing when a reservation is made. Um, And so that way we're not dealing with this after the fact situation of wondering whether an impaired patron is going to walk out and get in a car. Mm, yeah, very interesting. I'm just uh, thinking a little bit. I wonder if having some of those nap pods where you can take a little 15 minute nap would be <laughs> helpful here for these consumption lounges, because unlike alcohol, which can tend to um, elevate somebody's energy and um, reduce inhibitions and maybe, you know, when, when I'm out, I, I people get louder and more exuberant and they, they, you know, you've, you've seen some intoxicated people in the bar and, but with cannabis, I just don't, I just don't see that kind of personality or behavioral change happen as often. Um, It's just a different product. Would you agree? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, interesting. And, and that's um, that's part of the, you know, the issue that I pointed out too is gauging impairment. And I think we did hit on this uh, during our last discussion. So I don't need to get into that too deeply, but, um, you know, making sure that the, the, uh, the lounge servers are understanding what, what cannabis impairment looks like. And if that means people are sleepy, then yeah, I, I think the lounge pod is a great idea. I'd love to have a lounge <laughs> pod at every restaurant I go to because I am ready for a nap. When you get that food coma too, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> That's funny. I think uh, I think I may be onto something with the uh, the napping pods. We we used to joke about bringing those to our trade shows as well, or you know those three four day long conferences that you end up at. Like it's very tiring. Sometimes I just want to go take a little nap and then get back on the expo floor or whatever as well. Um, great. So in the last I minute, I think you're onto something, Bethany. I think so. I think so too. I think I'm going to have to go um, invent something or, or talk to, talk to somebody about this. Uh, you heard it here first, yep, folks. Yep. <laughs> if you have more questions, I'm happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, just any last thoughts here before we take our first commercial break? No, I, you know, I would just offer that there needs to be an emphasis here placed on by these operators in these, you know, designated consumption establishments on training, on impairment, and on what to do in the event that, you know, impairment becomes obvious. Mm -hmm. Dosage, things like that, standard operating procedures for 
interacting with the customer consumer uh, to make sure that everyone is safe, um, gets home safe. And uh, of course, the liability of the business as well. I think you may be right about uh, asking a customer to sign an agreement of some sort before being served. I think that's probably going to be a good idea in a lot of cases, or at least the first time that customer um, uses that establishment in the very least. It's That's probably a good idea. All right. So let's go ahead and take that first commercial break, and then we'll come back and chat more with Matthew Grimes and Jody Green. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice will return once we give a voice to our sponsors. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Okay, so why do people love my Total Body Bar workouts? Because they work. My clients get an amazing workout and great results. I'm Andrea Rogers, professional dancer and trainer, and my Extend Bar classes are fun, only 30 minutes, and proven to help you get sculpted, lean, and strong. And right now, you can stream my Extend Bar classes for free on the Beachbody On Demand app. See how effective these workouts truly are. Start for free today at Beachbody.com. All right, we're back on NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice on Cannabis Radio. I'm your host, Bethany Moore, and I'm speaking with a couple of members from our Risk Management and Insurance Committee, Jody Green and Matthew Grimes. We're talking, uh, it's a continuation of a previous episode, part one of the rise of cannabis consumption lounges and talking about the risks, liabilities, and opportunities associated there. So if we're looking at the current models that exist in each state, um, which states have taken those steps to open consumption lounges? And I'm curious if they're relatively the same from one state to the other, or if there's any stark differences in how they're allowed to operate or or how they're even licensed from, from one state to another. Uh, what are your thoughts, Jody? Well, there are a lot of differences. Um, and while we've seen a lot of states getting ready to implement regulations, there aren't a whole lot that actually have active open lounges. And when I say that, I'm talking about public lounges and not um, uh, private clubs, right? So the private club model is something that's been going on for quite a while. Um, companies can operate private clubs with membership fees where people can come and do whatever they want at them for the most part, right? Um, regardless of whether something is legal uh, on the state side. Um, but I'm not talking about that when I talk about these lounges. So, you know, in terms of where there are publicly available lounges, certainly uh, California, Colorado, and Nevada can come to mind, as well as Illinois. Uh, I know Matt more recently ha has some insight into Illinois, so I'll leave that one to him. Um, but I can talk a little bit about what's happening with uh, California for sure, because that's my home venue. Um, so California for quite a, quite some time now uh, has allowed uh, cannabis lounges, but the state delegates that decision to the local jurisdictions. So that means that uh, any city or, or county can decide whether they want to have it or not. And for the most part, most have said no. Um, so we haven't seen a lot of lounges, and I think that was ex exacerbated in part by the pandemic. Um, you know, it, lounges were maybe getting scheduled to open, and then the world shut down, uh, and that put a damper on a lot of things for a while. Uh, but we're seeing mm. things really start to emerge again, which is exciting. Um, so West Hollywood is one of the localities uh, in Los Angeles that is allowing cannabis lounges. In fact, they've dubbed themselves Emerald, like the Emerald City or something like that, uh, try, <laughs> trying to, you know, yeah. kind of focus on cannabis tourism. Um, and so right now there's one operating cannabis lounge, the Artistry. Um, I've been to it. It has an indoor outdoor space. Um and a variety of different uh, types of products available and along with um, different types of smoking implements that you can rent while you're there. Mm. Um, and that's that's a fairly typical model where people can come in, they can, you know, look at a menu of options, decide what they want, order it and consume it there um, and then take off. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some places like Nevada, for example, which is um, just, you know, just finalized their regulations is going to be a little bit different. 
Um, Nevada is going to be allowing single servings only, um, and they are not going to allow patrons to take home anything that's left over. So whatever they buy, they have to consume while they're there. So that's a little mm. bit different. Um, it is a, a more protectionist model, I think, you know, probably aimed at reducing potential liability, mm -hmm. um, which is, if you think about it in some respects, pretty smart when we think about the, the, the type of patrons that are likely to go there. Like we talked about in the last segment, uh, a lot of tourists are going to Las Vegas, for example. So, um, better to be mindful of, you know, having certain limitations in place to avoid liability. Um, but yeah, I think it, it really, the, the potential for lounges runs the gamut of, of really anything under the sun, just depending on the, the regulations that get laid out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew, what are your experiences? Uh, I agree completely. And here in Illinois, uh, there are a handful of consumption lounges now and, the trick there is, you know, of course, you need to comply with state and local guidelines. And when I say local guidelines, a lot of this, you know, isn't, uh, you know, once the state legalizes adult use uh, cannabis, the municipalities always have, or in Illinois anyway, they have optionality, which means that they can decide to allow those establishments within the confines of their borders or not. And so you'll need to work very closely with local politicians, local advocacy groups, uh, things of that nature, just to make sure that you are comporting with all of the compliance that has been laid out for you, both by the state and by the municipality. Uh, another state that is doing, I think, a really nice job here is Michigan. Michigan has had some forward thinking when it comes to cannabis consumption. And so while the whole state isn't allowing it, you're starting to see some, uh, you know, a, an awful lot of municipalities express interest. And then there are some that have gone all the way in. And I would like to highlight uh, Muskegon, Michigan here, where the mayor there is, you know, really making a difference in cannabis tourism and cannabis lounges by opening up his city to you know the safe consumption of cannabis by adults got it cool it's nice to see more and more states coming along and realizing that there is a need i mean not just for the tourists but you know there may be individuals that uh can't can't consume in their homes for whatever reason and, and need somewhere to go and all this talk is really kind of stirring my memory of Years, years ago uh, here in Colorado, being at a cannabis industry party of some kind, and it was an event like like an art gallery or maybe a nightclub. So the way things were set up back then, the attendees would go outside of the venue, load up on a party bus where they could then consume and, you know, there's joints and whatever so it was separate, um, but it was still, you know, part of the overall event. This was, of course, way, way before consumption lounge laws passed in 2016. So this had to have been 2015. Um, now we have these stationary consumption lounges um, that are not on wheels. They're actual mm -hmm. buildings. They have walls and chairs and everything. But yeah, that was such an interesting time. And it's just interesting to think about how over the last seven, eight years, we're, we're moving into a different era as well. Are there anything, is there anything else that comes to mind about the similarities or the differences um, with these laws as, as they're starting to roll out? Well, I'll also point out a couple of things. So, you know, in terms of in case listeners are interested in, in what states might be opening up lounges soon, um, Worth mentioning that we, we've we seen New York and New Jersey uh, pass regulations that will allow lounges. Uh, all of that is not yet quite finalized, so we're not seeing any lounges open up yet, but that's, you know, something that probably we'll, we'll be looking for in, in 2023, um, along with uh, some other states as well. So, you know, I think that the more states that do this and, you know, local governments can understand that... Uh, you know, nothing crazy is happening, right? We'll we'll see others jump on the bandwagon hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, there are a lot of differences in the way that the regulations are structured. Um, and, you know, I, I would hope that when the regs are getting done, uh, that uh, politicians and go local governments are considering, um, you know, the way that those regulations potentially impact business. So um, one question I've been asked a lot when I talk about consumption lounges is like, why would anyone really want to do that? You know, why would you want to go somewhere and just smoke a joint, you know, like mm -hmm. if you go to a restaurant, you can get food. If you go to a bar, there's all these other things to do. Right. Um, the, if limitations are so stringent on what you can and can't do in a lounge, it, it really makes it a little off putting. Um, so hopefully there will be um, some room for lounges to have other activities, right. To have entertainment uh, options, comedy shows, uh, you know, mm. to open up like a sports bar, to do art gallery type events, um, to, you know, anything under the sun, music venues, et cetera. Yeah. Um, pinball so make it more machines. inviting to a variety of people. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. I love that. Okay. Let's, um, let's take our last commercial break and then come back and begin to wrap up our conversation here about sen sensible consumption lounge laws and regulations. So stay tuned. We will be right back. NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice will return once we give a voice to our sponsors. All right, we're back on NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice, talking with Jody Green and Matthew Grimes about sensible cannabis, cannabis consumption lounge laws and regulations. Uh, I mean, there is definitely a benefit to the communities, the individuals, uh, the government, the man of having sensible laws and regulations and, and maybe not going overboard. And it was interesting to hear what you were saying before the break about there possibly being limitations on what kinds of activities you can even do, you know, so what are you doing? Just sitting on a chair, staring at the wall, smoking a joint, right? Right. If, if that's all it's going to be, you know, like, why not just do it at home and understanding that some people can't do it at home, but um, yeah, you have to create an environment that's inviting to a, a variety of people. Um, so I think that, you know, hopefully the governments will be, um, understanding to that because it's awesome. a win-win for everybody, right? Um, part of, part of the benefit to the man is taxes, uh, getting money from taxes. So <laughs> let's not forget that. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's not forget the taxes. That's to be sure. Um, you know, this, for me, again, this comes back to public health and public safety. If you're allowed to sell cannabis within your state borders, uh, yet you don't have anywhere for medical patients or recreational patients to consume it safely, well, then you're doing a disservice to the community and ultimately to you know law enforcement in your state. You're creating a lot of difficulties that don't really need to exist. And just back to you know this whole experience at the lounge, you know, let's let's not forget uh, that this doesn't necessarily need to be just sitting in a room and smoking a joint. I know that the regs will outline this sort of in a state by on a state by state basis and municipality by municipality. But there are a bunch of different form factors that are available out there. A lot of uh, governments are loath to allow edibles, uh, but I think that there is real momentum gathering behind cannabis beverages that have a low THC content and are designed to be more like session beers or you know session uh, drinks. And so you can sit there and have a more, uh, an environment that's more akin to that that you would find in a, a bar or a club somewhere where that type of socialization is able to occur uh, you know, without the fear of being stigmatized because you're engaging in cannabis consumption and so I think that there's real upside for all these establishments. Uh, we just need to work with the regulators to make sure that they are, you know, mindful of business considerations when they're implementing these these regs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, there was a webinar that you all created from the committee as well that listeners can go to our website and find and and watch as well. I'm trying to identify the name of that one so they can find it easier, but we will figure that out later. Um, so as we're wrapping here in the last just couple of minutes, um, from an insurance perspective, 
from a paperwork perspective, what are a couple of things that we should be thinking of and be aware of? Matt, do you want to take that one or should I? I yeah, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll start and I'll be brief here. But one thing that I think maybe flies under the radar here uh, when it comes to, you know, good old fashioned insurance is employment practices liability. That is uh, things like discrimination or sexual harassment. And that is, again, something that an operator needs to be mindful of when hiring these people and considering the environment in which these people are working. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of considerations. Um, I think, you know, the big takeaway on insurance, which is no one's favorite topic, <laughs> <laughs> is find a knowledgeable insurance broker who knows cannabis. Okay, don't just hire your neighborhood broker who does your other business if you haven't been involved in cannabis before, because this is extremely specialized. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have had clients, you know, come to me and say, I was told this is the only insurance policy I could get. And I look at it and it's absolute trash. Mm -hmm. And I say, that's a lie. <laughs> so if your broker told you that, if your broker's saying you can only get this one policy, uh, you know, find someone else and get a second opinion. That's because uh, that broker only has access to the one market. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, so there's a lot more out there than people think. We hear a lot about how insurance is so hard for cannabis. Yes, it is. It's ch it's more challenging than, you know, a construction business. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but there are options. It's opened up a lot in the last few years. Um, and so I would say, you know, some things to look out for if you are a cannabis lounge, if you're going to be opening a lounge, um, make sure that your policy uh, schedules the specific location uh, that you're operating on the declarations. Um, sometimes there will be a, an, a scheduled operations exclusion. So if it's not specifically listed, um, you won't have coverage for that. Uh, make sure there's not a cannabis liability or intoxication exclusion. Those are very common. Um, uh, you know, it, there are so many potential issues with insurance that it's just important to have somebody in your corner that knows how to read a policy and what's really available in the market. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Yeah, we'll um, we'll have to come back and perhaps do a round three in a in a few more months here and see how things uh, transpire. And for those who are interested in the webinar, it was August sixteenth of twenty twenty two. It's called Cannabis Consumption Lounges and the Next Wave of Hospitality Disruption. So you can certainly watch the recording of that webinar on our website or on our YouTube as well. And quick final announcement before we wrap up, our next 11th annual Cannabis Industry Lobby Days in Washington, D.C. will be taking place May 16th through 18th. And you can certainly begin to register for that on our website. And we have some very cool sponsorship opportunities available as well. I'm looking forward to that, considering how much of a success our 10th annual Cannabis Industry Lobby Days was in September. Okay, uh, we have run out of time. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Matthew. I look forward to speaking with you again as we continue to learn more and wrap our arms around the Cannabis Consumption Lounges. Thanks, you both, for being on the show. Thank you. It's Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of NCIA's Cannabis Industry Voice. Until next time. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited. Geico presents Daily Affirmations. Repeat after me, we are filled with an abundance of joy. We are filled with an abundance of joy. Also an abundance of questions. Good thing Geico has 24-7 claim service to help answer questions and resolve claims quickly. Uh, good thing Geico has 24-7 claim service. We are also filled with an abundance of biscuits. We are also filled with, uh, I don't think it works this way. Oh, oh, and jam. Don't forget jam. To manifest more Geico in your life, go to geico.com.